Bonjour, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi de présenter Cléo Pascal. Je remercie nos panélistes précédents et je voudrais juste faire un, un le pont avec, euh, sur, sur l'engagement, en fait, un engagement dont on a bien besoin dans le, dans le secteur euh, sur la question des, des changements climatiques. Et euh, un, un fait qu'on on, on, on devrait propager euh, davantage, euh, c'est euh, les, les études en psychologie, en psychologie sociale, qui nous rappellent en fait que l'engagement euh, citoyen est un important facteur de bonheur. Et je pense qu'on ne le dit pas assez. Peut-être que ça fera en sorte que plus d'individus auraient envie de, de s'engager de différentes manières, non seulement dans leur sujet de recherche, mais dans l'action citoyenne. Alors, sans plus tarder, euh, j'aimerais vous présenter Cléo Pascal, qui est née à Montréal, a grandi près de Saint-Hippolyte, à une soixantaine de kilomètres d'ici. Elle a donc inévitablement étudié à McGill. Après un parcours scolaire des plus normaux, dont l'apogée fut le prix de la meilleure histoire d'Halloween, décernée par la bibliothèque de la ville de Ville-Saint-Laurent, elle avait huit ans et il n'y avait pas d'autre candidat, a-t-elle précisé. Cléo Pascal a appris à dactylographier, puis est devenue journaliste. Elle a tenu des chroniques à la radio CBC, au National Post, au Toronto Star. Elle a été productrice et animatrice à la radio CBC, a écrit des séries télévisées qui ont gagné des prix Emmy. Elle a aussi écrit pour des magazines allant de The Economist au feu et regretté Weekly World News. Une seule fois, il fallait bien payer le loyer, dit-elle. Alors que Mme Pascal cherchait réponse à de grandes questions existentielles, elle s'est retrouvée dans les profondeurs de groupes de réflexion. Elle est actuellement chercheuse associée au Chatham House du Royal Institute of International Affairs à Londres. Elle y est spécialiste de la confluence des changements géopolitiques, géoéconomiques et géophysiques. Elle a donné des conférences où elle a conseillé l'Army War College aux États-Unis, le Royal College of Defense Studies au Royaume-Uni, le Collège de défense nationale en Inde, le Service canadien du renseignement de sécurité, le département de l'énergie aux États-Unis, le Bureau des affaires étrangères de l'Allemagne, le ministère des Affaires étrangères et du Commonwealth, de même que les dirigeants de plusieurs grandes entreprises et des professionnels de la sécurité depuis plus de 30 ans. Elle enseigne actuellement à l'Université Manipal en Inde et elle est aussi l'auteur de ce livre qui est disponible à l'extérieur, Global Roaring. Donc, euh, pour bien pouvoir profiter de son intervention, je vais m'asseoir dans la salle. Après 45 minutes, je lui ferai un petit signe. Je reviendrai ici pour animer une période de questions. Donc, Cléo, merci infiniment d'avoir fait toute cette route pour venir nous parler aujourd'hui. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici, un honneur pour moi. Euh, J'ai euh, grandi au Canada dans les années euh, 70 et 80, alors euh, it took a long time for me to realize there could be a prime minister in Canada that wasn't Trudeau. So to be associated with this is, a, is an enormous honor and pleasure. Um, I'm going to be talking about this confluence of the three geos. The world is changing very, very quickly. There are three global systems that are in flux like we haven't seen before. Um, the, uh, I don't quite know how this, how do I, oh yeah, there you can see it, but I can't. Um, <laughs> this picture summarizes how the world is changing. This is China's icebreaker. Now, if we had talked 10 years ago about China being an Arctic power, I think a lot of people would have been rather skeptical. But China has the geoeconomic weight to buy one of these very expensive ships that Canada doesn't seem to be able to put up the cash for at the moment. It has the geopolitical weight to push its way into the Arctic. And the geophysical changes in the Arctic, thank you very much, Lau, um, are making the Arctic attractive. So this image of China's icebreaker is showing how very quickly the world is changing and how we really aren't having the discussions that we need to have about what's going on. And just to talk a little bit about how important the environment is, how the geophysical changes are affecting the geopolitical and the geoeconomic, let's start by talking about where we are. So we're in Montreal and why are we in Montreal? Well, as we found out yesterday, or should know anyway, um, 
this area has been inhabited for several thousand years, and for the several thousand years, it was, very, it was changed very little because the economics and the politics of the people who lived there involved very light use of the land. But then Europeans came along and they had a very different approach to politics and economics, resource extraction and empire building. And so they looked at Montreal and they said, huh, two big rivers come in, the Ottawa River and the St. Lawrence River that lead into very large areas of available resources. It goes out to the Atlantic, which brings us to the markets in Europe, but it has a problem, which is that there are rapids in the St. Lawrence and the back river is blocked. So this is as far as we can get our ships in. There's a relatively good port. There's a mountain which gives us view over the river, which makes it a good defensive fortification. So we're going to set up shop here. And so the geophysical environment of the area determined the settlement of the area. And the culture of the time, the geopolitical and uh, geoeconomic imperatives, made it so that we not only moved into this already good environment, but we improved it for our... Um, benefit. And that meant we built the Lachine Canal to bypass the rapids and we put in the railways so we could increase the rate of resource extraction. And this is how we, the dominant economic and political culture of the last 250, 300 years has looked at the environment. We take a look at what's already there and we build into it to benefit. And you can see it all over the world. These are defensive fortifications built all over the world uh, at different times, but essentially they look the same. They look the same because <laughs> they're very easy to defend, they're difficult to attack. Uh, in fact, um, if you can see kind of Matsada, for example, um, the assumption that was made was the physical environment that was there when you build it isn't going to change. So in the case of all of these, the assumption is, for example, water won't be cut off. If water gets cut off, if your environment changes, it goes from being a very good defensive fortification to being a death trap. In the case of what happened in Mitsada, very good defensive fortification. They had enough water, but it fell because the Romans physically changed the environment. They built a huge ramp up the side and changed it to the point where the environment had become something else. And essentially, that's what's happening to us all over the world. We're building into the environment, assuming it won't change, and when it changes, we have a problem. And you can see it very clearly in things like airports. We build airports in big, flat areas. Usually that means by the coast or by, by a river system. And as the environment changes, our airports are flooding. This is a very small section of airports that have been flooded. LaGuardia is going to keep flooding. JFK is going to keep flooding. The physical environment, the status quo that we assumed is no longer a status quo. It's in flux. Not only that, not only is the environment changing because of climate change, we are, as we saw with the Romans and Mitsada, we are re-engineering the environment and in some cases weakening it somewhat dramatically. So this is a map of every single red line is a tropical cyclone or also called hurricane that's hit the U.S. coast in the case of the, Pacific, in the Atlantic side, in the last 150 years. So it's not a surprise that a city like New Orleans, that's in a hurricane zone, would get hit by a hurricane. So why did we see the extensive damage that we saw in 2005? Well, we had essentially engineered the disaster by putting in bad levy, levies, by a lack of town planning by creating large scale subsidence with the draining of wetlands, extraction of groundwater, that sort of thing. So we had taken a marginal area and undermined its defenses to a very large degree, to the point where, as you can see in the bottom, we had offshore rigs jammed under bridges because of how we hadn't taken into account not only a change, but our effect on weakening in the context of the change. So it's not just enough to look at climate change when you're look at, looking at trying to uh, reinforce against vulnerable infrastructure. You also have to look at our effect on the environment and how that's weakening that. And a lot of this, a lot of this kind of undermining of the infrastructure is done because of short-term economic reasons. And we see it in other factors as well. 
So, for example, it doesn't, a five-year-old can tell you not to put a nuclear plant in an earthquake zone. This is Fukushima. Right? So how did this nuclear plant get built in an earthquake zone? Our economic structures, the ones that created the financial crisis of 2008, are extremely good at distorting, discounting, and disguising risk. And the insurance sector, which is a very healthy part of the market, which should be telling us when not to do stupid things, is getting uh, perverted through a whole range of techniques, like, for example, government-backed insurance. The US National Flood Insurance Program is insane. It subsidizes disaster. It puts people and industry in harm's way and is consistently bankrupt and is costing billions of dollars. But because uh, local, because beachfront property has a very high value, people are paying high property taxes, so the local governments put a lot of pressure on the local congressmen to keep the system in play. And you're going to see consistent continuation of this sort of problem, unless it's dealt with head on. Caps on liabilities is another problem that you have. So uh, if, you're, if you're BP and you think you have a cap of 100 million for your offshore rig, why would you put uh, $101 million worth of safety mechanisms in? It's just bad business. Another thing, BP couldn't even get government-backed insurance for its, for its rig, so it created its own insurance company. It was allowed to self-insure through a front company that I think they thought essentially could go bankrupt and absorb the cost. Um, these, all of these mechanisms, very similar to the sort of mentality we saw create 2008. And then, of course, there's uh, the use of externalities and calculations when assessing risk. So in the same way that kind of, uh, you know, our physical infrastructure is not really acknowledging the inherent risk in the system, our financial infrastructure is also creating these problems. So essentially, the same mentality that created the financial risk that led to 2008 is creating a direct physical risk. This isn't paper risk. This is nuclear power plants and earthquake zones. Now, our, our system is not the only system in play at the moment. So I'm, gonna, I'm not so comfortable with these terms, but because we don't have a lot of time, these are the terms we're going to use. So we're going to talk roughly about the West and the re-emerging world. Now, often you'll hear about uh, places like India and China talking, talk, you know, the emerging world. But if you're in India or China, they consider themselves re-emerging after kind of, you know, like a bad 200, 300 years. Very different psychology. And there's a very different approach and view and interaction with the, with the world in the West and in the re-emerging world. And it comes down to a lot, to time perspective. So in the West, we consider ourselves essentially at a time of peace. We might have troops in Afghanistan, but we feel we're at peace. Our house isn't going to be blown up when we get home. We're not going to have a fight on our border, nothing like that. If you're in India, you have four or five hostile countries on your border. That means your security and defense establishment is much more important in governance. You've got a longer-term time perspective in terms of actually securing uh, your, your uh, physical stability. So it, it's a very different approach. We have what I call developed country complacency syndrome, where we sort of figure we're developed. You know, we little tweaking here and there, but we're fine. And as we just heard, we're actually not very fine. Our infrastructure, a lot of our governance structures are designed for 100 years ago or 50 years ago, if you're very lucky. Whereas in the re-emerging world, there's a very visible sense of growth. Every time I go back to Delhi, it looks different than the last time I was there. Every time I go back to Detroit, it looks worse than the last time I was there. So you can feel it. You can feel the growth. There's a, a sense of national mission. Infrastructure is being put in for the first time in many places. It's a very dynamic environment. We also assume that our international structures, which in many cases we designed, are there to stay. There's a lot of questioning of that if you're sitting in Delhi or Beijing or Pretoria, you know, they're questioning why is it always a European or 
an American at the head of the IMF for the World Bank. And there's an active move to bypass those systems. The BRICS have announced that they are setting up a competitor to the World Bank. They announced a $100 billion currency fund to protect against things like the Asian financial crisis. Happened a while back. There's a question about the US, being the reserve, US dollar being the reserve currency, that China's very actively trying to internationalize the renminbi through mechanisms that we don't identify as an internationalization of the currency, through uh, currency swaps, bilateral relations, but which is having that effect. When we talk about R2P, re responsibility to protect, we assume that we get to decide who gets to be protected. We had this problem in Syria recently, where the West was saying, we have to go in to protect a certain population group, and Russia was saying, yeah, and we also have to go in to protect the other population group. So there's a real questioning of these international systems, and it's very active, and quite frankly, the West, to the, for the most part, is broke. And so the ability to project these international systems is weakening to a large degree. That's how geopolitics, geoeconomics is affecting geopolitics. We also have, as was discussed before, generational stagnation. We'll be lucky if our kids do better than we do. In the re-emerging world, there is an assumption that the children will do better. And as a result, they're willing to make the sacrifice. In China, you're willing to go be a factory worker if your child has the chance of being a doctor. Again, it gives you a longer term time perspective. And we have extremely short-term political horizons. In the US, two years at best, and now the primaries are coming into play. Really shortens your ability to make decisions. So if you were Kennedy now, and you would announce that you're going to get to the moon by the end of the decade, which means even if you had lived, even if you'd been re-elected, that's another president's win. That would be a very hard thing to pull off now that sort of long-term visionary approach to leadership becomes increasingly difficult as the governance structures become shorter. In the re-emerging world, for better or for worse, the governance structures are much more long-term. So China has a decadal shift. Uh, Putin seems immortal politically. Quite sure how he pulls it off. Um, and in India, you have essentially um, kind of political parties belong to families, which creates a whole other structure. But again, what you're getting is very different approaches to governance, to economics, to planning for the future. And you can see it clearly in a meeting that was held. This is from a WikiLeaks document. So apologies to any State Department people who are here, but it's very useful, so we're going to use it. Uh, that was held between US officials and Gazprom in, on September 19, 2008. So this is four days after Lehman Brothers has collapsed. And the question that the American officials had for Gazprom is, what are your corporate priorities? So the Russians said, one, to fulfill the gas needs of domestic, industrial, and residential consumers. Two, to fulfill its social obligations, which include an effective variety of charitable projects throughout the country. That's a domestic security agenda. They're using the gas to keep the population quiet. So the Americans said, uh, what about maximizing shareholder values? Like, you're a corporation, right? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? And, the, and then the Russians, the Russians must have loved this. And then the Russians said, oh, yeah, our other goal is to maximize control over global energy resources. So very different outlooks and discussions are being held. And if a country is talking like this about one resource, they're probably thinking about other resources in the same way. So again, back to Russia. Russia in 2010 developed a national food security doctrine because food security is becoming an increasing issue globally. And they said, food security of the Russian Federation is one of the key areas of ensuring the country's national security in the medium term. And they set quotas, almost Soviet-style quotas, for how much of the food consumed in the country had to be produced in the country. So 95% of all grain and tomatoes eaten in Russia needs to be produced in Russia. That meant that that summer, when they had fires linked potentially to a warming climate, they banned all wheat export, which combined with speculation in the market drove global wheat prices up 80%. And in countries like Egypt, which heavily subsidized wheat, the wheat prices went up 
and the first demand of the people on Tyre Square was food. So you're seeing ripple effects where you get geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geophysical changes coming together and creating unexpected cascading effects. And it's very, very clear. The Russians have said foreign trade policy must be developed in compliance with food security criteria. It's going to have a big effect when you head into WTO negotiations and this is your prime directive in terms of food supply. The game in many parts of the world is changing. So it's capitalism, but not as we know it. And we need to understand that when we're sitting around the table, different people are thinking very different things. Some countries are playing Monopoly, like most of the West, and some are playing Risk. Some countries are looking at food, things like wheat as a commodity. Some are looking at it as a strategic asset. And that changes the economics and the politics when you're trying to secure that supply. Now, I'm going to be getting into a bit of a case study, but before I do that, I want to just acknowledge, obviously, I'm sort of analyzing the behavior of other countries, which is very dodgy to begin with. And I want to acknowledge that we all have uh, our own geopolitical articles of faith, things that we believe that we may or may not even acknowledge that determine the way we do our strategic assessments. And I call them gaffes because often we're mistaken, but it's useful to understand what they are. So usually if I disagree with somebody, when I have a strategic discussion with them, I disagree with them on one of these three things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the premise of this is that if, you're, if your end point is different, if you have a Buddhist and Anglican and Catholic and they're talking about what happens with life after death, the way that they plan to get to death is going to be very different. So that's why it's important to understand different people's articles of faith. So my questions are, is the Chinese Communist Party or is it not expansionist beyond what's required for Chinese economic security. These are things you need to think about yourself when you're starting, if you're, if you're going to be making decisions about how to plan your government or your foreign policy or economic engagement. Is the Chinese Communist Party or not committed to the current international systems? Will Chinese economy grow, stagnate, or collapse by 2013? I picked 2013 because it's the 10th anniversary and we're looking forward 10 years. If we disagree on this, we're probably going to disagree on the case study that I'm about to discuss. But I want to put my cards on the table to begin with. And in the question and answer, we can discuss some of these issues later. So what's the case study? We are going to look at the Kingdom of Tonga, which is a tiny country in the South Pacific. It has a, a population of about 100,000. But the people in Tonga know more about geopolitics than your average McGill poli sci grad because this is an area that is being heavily competed for by the West, the UAE, China. And what's happening in Tonga is, is very emblematic of what's happening in South America, in Africa, and many other places. And we're going to talk about Tonga because it really doesn't have many resources. It's a small country. There's no reason by Western strategic assessment standards people should be paying such attention to it. But they are. So let's see why. First of all, where is Tonga? According to Western maps, it's actually kind of not even on the map. It's way, way at the edge of both sides of the map. If you join the map together, there'd be a little gap, and it would be in where that little gap is. Okay. So what happened? Well, the Cold War finished. It used to be a strategic zone. The Cold War finished. And then there was this kind of end of history syndrome. And we've seen this all over the world where the big boys, the US, the UK, and others, pulled out of areas that seemed to be of marginal strategic value and handed it over to local management. So in this case, uh, the UK in 2006 actually closed three high commissions in the region and overtly said, all right, New Zealand, Australia, you manage these uh, local little countries now. And New Zealand and Australia said, great, because like, who cares about New Zealand strategically, but it's included in the Five Eyes uh, Security Alliance, which has been in the news recently. And now this gave it a reason to have a seat at the table. It's delivering 14 Pacific votes in international fora. It makes New Zealand and Australia more important. 
And New Zealand and Australia went in hard. If you go into Tonga now, you'll see Australian or New Zealand staffers in key positions in every ministry. The IT system at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was set up by, by New Zealand Aid, um, which means that they have the passwords for everybody's accounts. The Commissioner of Police is from New Zealand. This is kind of overt, old-style colonial management of an independent, seemingly independent country. And on paper, Australia and New Zealand deliver these countries. But there's been a problem. And the problem is, I don't know what you call it when you use soft power to get people to hate you, but the people of the Pacific hate the Australians and the New Zealanders because they've been treated with incredible disrespect. This is a, a screen grab from a character description from a television show that's on New Zealand TV. Uh, the premise of the television show is a New Zealand diplomat has been caught in the backseat of a car with a member of the British royal family and is getting punished for his indiscretion by having to go work in the consulate of a Pacific island. That's the starting premise, right? And then there are all these wacky natives in the consulate that, you know, much hilarity ensues. So this is one of the characters from the show. This is on the national broadcaster in New Zealand. And this is her, I'll read a line from her character description. Suga is the niece of a cousin of the king. She has come to New Zealand to marry a rich white man and to have many babies to him. This is the, this is the level at which New Zealand and South Africa treat the Pacific Islanders. And it's all over their media. So you see, for example, on Radio Australia, here's an article about Tonga's no confidence vote, a sign of instability. In fact, there wasn't a no confidence vote, and there was no political problem whatsoever. Tonga moves on protection orders for victims of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse rates in Tonga are very similar to those in Australia and New Zealand. But the narrative is that Tonga is unstable and violent and medieval, and the narrative serves Australia and New Zealand's purposes because then it can justify in Washington or in London direct intervention into the country, which includes economic intervention. Whereas in reality, that's the king of Tonga. He's the chancellor of the University of South Pacific. Tonga has one of the highest PhD rates per capita. It's a very stable country with a strong intact social system. There is no problem in the country. But I would suspect that many, there are many people from, if there are anybody from other parts of the world, they will recognize this pattern of creating an instability narrative as an excuse for intervention. So the result is, welcome to China. The Tongans quite rightly say, you guys have been treating us incredibly badly for an incredibly long period of time. And then China shows up and treats us with a modicum of respect and gives us a slightly better deal economically. So we're very happy to deal with the Chinese. This is a Chinese naval ship that visited Tonga in 2010, military ship, and their banner is build friendship bridges to meet good friends. It's a very different approach than what you see on New Zealand TV. This, what's happening in Tonga, is happening in South America, it's happening in Africa, it's happening all over Asia. Mismanagement of the Western relationship with the Allies is leaving an open door for China and others to step right in. And if you're from China and you've got a longer term perspective, where is Tonga actually? Well, you can see the growing economies of Asia and the strong economies of still of North America and South America encircle the area that Tonga is in. It's actually highly strategic. It's a zone that's seeing an enormous amount of shipping enormous amount of transshipment, and if there is an increasing problem between uh, China and the West, it's the new front line. The re-examining our maps from a new perspective is critical for understanding how the rest of the world is seeing how the world is changing. So why is, Tonga, why is China engaging in Tonga? This is the captain of that ship that we saw visiting Tonga. The first day that ship was in port, it was only open to ethnic Chinese living in Tonga. It was only the second day that the, that the actual Tongans were allowed in. And it's not Taiwan. They'll tell you it's uh, China-Taiwan competition in the Pacific, but it's not. It's votes in international fora. <coughs> They've got, the Pacific has about 14 votes in international fora. 
The Pacific was one of the key regions that swung the headquarters of IRENA being from Germany to being in Abu Dhabi. The Deputy Prime Minister of Tonga has said bluntly that they will support China in any international fora. Strategic positioning, we know about the, uh, uh, the chain of pearls around uh, India. I suspect there's also a Pacific wall being, being built, and it's a stepping stone to the Indian Ocean. If you're looking at it from a maritime perspective, the growing importance of the Indo-Pacific. And I think there's a potential for China being, putting in dual-use installations. There's also the seabed mining fisheries, satellite launch slots. Um, PATCOM Chief Admiral, Admiral Lockler, said last year, $5 trillion of commerce rides on the Asia-Pacific sea lanes, and the Pacific is riding in the middle of it. This is actually not a marginal area. We've just been very blinkered in the way that we've been looking at it, and other countries that have been up, taking a three-geo approach have been much more aware. Now, there's a lot of talk about Chinese population movement in the last 10, 15 years. There's been an enormous outflow of Chinese population around the world, and it's been an interesting phenomenon. So just in Tonga, and remember, Tonga has a population of 100,000. There's been an enormous increase in business partnerships with the elite, in under a decade, Chinese nationals have gained control of about 90% of the retail sector. There's been a large-scale immigration of Chinese workers to work on those Chinese infrastructure projects. This young man is, young engineer, is standing in the middle of downtown Nuku'alofa in the capital of the Kingdom of Tonga. In the context of bureaucracy, there's been an outreach, which often includes uh, bribery and other things, specifically targeting immigration and customs which has uh, resulted in some very questionable practices around the issuance of passports to Chinese nationals with very few background checks, and goodness knows what's coming in on those containers. Enormous soft power outreach. Um, if you're a journalist or a policymaker in Tonga, no problem getting a scholarship. Um, they gave every MP a free computer, so New Zealand might control the internet uh, accounts, but <laughs> Actual computers are, um, are Chinese. Unbelievable security risk, but whatever. Uh, within the past month, China has announced a $1 billion soft loan package for the Pacific, including 2,000 scholarships for uh, Pacific Island nations. This is a very heavy engagement for a country that just has 100,000 people in it. And it's been incredibly socially disruptive because there's been very little ground level engagement. The elite are happy with it because they've got an option to being treated like uh, more than second rate citizens by Australia and New Zealand, but the people on the ground are seeing the disruption and are, are questioning uh, whether this is good for them. And it's created a lot of problems. This Chinese infrastructure that's being built all over the Pacific and Africa and Latin America in many cases is very poorly designed and it's creating flooding and it's, gonna, it's questionable whether it'll be able to withstand the next earthquake. There were riots in 2006 for another reason, but the first targets were the shops, the Chinese shops. Over 30 were burnt down and looted and the Chinese government sent in a plane to evacuate the Chinese citizens. The photo at the bottom is one of the Chinese shops that got looted. Um, the same thing had happened a few months earlier in the Solomon Islands. There are regular robberies at Chinese shops, unless the Chinese go to church, in which case um, they don't, because uh, there's a chance that the Chinese owner might know your mom, and then that'll get you in trouble. But it's basically to show that when, if there's an attempt to engage with the community, the community is very accepting. But if the community keeps to itself, which it tends to do, they're considered fair game. And Tonga is seeing crime that it's never seen before associated with this new Chinese community. So for example, human trafficking, forgery, drug smuggling, kidnapping, arson, murder. Tonga has no, Tonga has no money to deport. Um, the New Zealand police commissioner doesn't speak Tongan, let alone Mandarin. It's a really big problem. And it's not just Tonga. Fiji has announced it should align itself with visionary China instead of... Australia and New Zealand. This is all over the region, and in fact, all over the world. Now let's throw in our third geo and see what happens then. We talked about how our physical infrastructure is disconnecting from um, 
uh, the real infrastructure. But a lot of our legal and regulatory infrastructure assumes the environment won't change as well. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, you get a coastline and you get 200 miles off your coastline. That assumes your coastline isn't going to change. The law does not take into account environmental change. So if you get 200 miles off your coastline and your coastline retreats, does your exclusive economic zone retreat along with it? It's not covered by the law. If you have an offshore island and it deviates your border and the island disappears, what happens to your border? This is already becoming an issue in the South China Sea. We discuss the South China Sea a lot. It's worthwhile looking at some of the islands, tiny little islands that are anchoring those massive claims. In order for the island to anchor a claim, it has to be habited. So these are some very unlucky Chinese soldiers that are anchoring massive exclusive economic zone claims in the South China Sea. It's not going to take a lot of sea level rise to create a very complex problem in the region. And when you're looking at the Pacific, where your elevation of many, many of your islands is about two meters above sea level if you're lucky, it raises a further question. If your population has to move and your islands become uninhabited, does your country cease to exist? Do you lose the seat in the UN? You know, what happens? It's not covered. And so when you start putting this all together, you see, for example, <laughs> Kiribati has a relationship with Taiwan, but it's talking about moving its population to Fiji, which has a relationship with China. So if Kiribati needs to become friends with Fiji, will it have to switch its political alliance from Taiwan to China? This is not a minor thing when you look at the size of the exclusive economic zones of these countries. Kiribati has an exclusive economic zone the size of India. These are actually extremely large, very dynamic geopolitical and geoeconomic crises being triggered by geophysical change. Which brings us to China and the Arctic. This is a Chinese map of the Arctic showing how um, the routes of the Northwest and Northeast Passage will shorten their uh, access to markets. China is very active in the Arctic. They have research bases in the Arctic and Antarctic, observer status of the Arctic Council, it has another icebreaker on order. It's the, building the biggest embassy in Iceland. It has a free trade agreement with Iceland. It's increasing visit to the Faroe Island, which is another Arctic Council state. There's a proposal for two to 3,000 Chinese laborers to go to Greenland. Uh, Ch Greenland passed a law lowering um, the uh, uh, minimum wage just so that they could justify bringing in these foreign workers. And there's a big question about whether, you know, you bring in two, 3,000 young men, are you going to have to bring a broth brothel to service that society? It's extremely socially disruptive. The same problems you would see in Tonga, you will see there. There's a large number of Chinese nationals working in Siberia, by some account, two to three million. And they're actively courting Canadian Aboriginal leaders. We had a really interesting discussion uh, talk yesterday by Chief Atlio. He is... He has much more bargaining power than, <laughs> than the Canadian government acknowledges. And you saw it very clearly in 2008 when 25 Canadian Aboriginal leaders were invited to China. China is very good at identifying populations like the Tongans in the context of Australia and New Zealand that have been treated very badly and they offer them a bit of a better deal. So these are some quotes from that trip. So uh, the delegation head said, Canadian Aboriginals own or control about a third of the Canadian landmass, and they went to Beijing to tell China that Aboriginal Canada was open for business. And another chief said, this was an important step for us in moving forward. Our future is not only in Canada, but in partnering with other countries. So in the same way that the way Australia and New Zealand treated the Tongans have pushed them into another camp, this is, Chief Atlio yesterday talked about the hard way and the harder way, for larger Canada, this is the harder way. And unless we redress our relationship, there are other people definitely waiting in the wings, waiting to give them a better deal, the deal that they should be getting from us to begin with. So Chinese foreign policy definitely gets the three geos more than most. This is China celebrating International Polar Day. Okay. And they have a long-term plan. But just because you have a long-term plan doesn't mean the plan is any good. And there are some real problems with Chinese uh, approach to the environment, in particular, which have the, has the potential to undermine its ability. So 
comes down a lot to the psychology of governance. China is building a massive hydro project to redirect water from the south of the country to the north. And this is a quote from one of the engineers involved. I don't feel we're conquering nature. We think nature itself isn't very fair. God isn't fair. Why is that? He's given southern China so much water, but given the north so little. It's good land, nice flat land. But we say, as God isn't fair, we're trying to balance out God's unfairness. So as King Knut can tell you, this sort of approach doesn't really work that well, and China's already starting to see problems. And if you look at one of its major economic centers, Shanghai, the word Shanghai means above the sea, which implies there's a lot of sea around. And if you look at it, there is. Shanghai is like New Orleans. It's a city in an active delta. It's subsiding. It's in a typhoon pathway. This is a list of evacuations of at least 100,000 people that has happened since 2005 to 2013, and it will continue. It's a mathematical certainty that Shanghai will get hit in a major way. Brand new buildings in China are just falling over because they've fallen, they've completely lost track of their underground hydrology. So according to my geopolitical articles of faith, what do the three geos mean for what this foundation stands for? Affirmation of human rights, exercise of citizenship, protection of the environment, effect and globalization, democracy in the 21st century. Well, as the Western system weakens in large part through unnecessary short-sighted self-inflicted wounds, new systems are coming to the fore that in some cases are copying the worst of the Western systems while adding even more repressive elements. It's going to be a tough 10 year for, for Trudeau's four pillars. That was very depressing, so here's a cute puppy. <laughs> And thank you very much. Merci. Merci. Peux avoir le micro? Oui. Merci infiniment, euh, Cléo, pour euh, la complexité de, 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 de ta présentation qui est nécessaire, je pense, pour euh, faire face aux enjeux euh, actuels. Merci pour... Euh, ton intelligence incisive et ta perspective transdisciplinaire, on a, on a vraiment besoin de ça en ce moment. En ce moment où à Varsovie, en fait, la conférence internationale sur le climat dérape. Hier, je ne sais pas si vous avez vu dans les journaux, mais les euh, ONG ont décidé de faire front commun et de quitter la conférence. Euh, donc, euh, il va falloir réfléchir à d'autres euh, moyens euh, de, de relever ces immenses défis qui euh, vont bien au-delà de du simple, la simple question euh, environnementale, parce que tout est lié, euh, comme on, on l'a vu dans ta présentation et comme on l'a vu hier aussi dans les interventions qui ont, qui ont été faites. Alors, euh, on n'a pas énormément de temps, euh, mais on veut quand même prendre quelques questions. Je vous invite à, à venir euh, au, au micro euh, et à, à vous adresser directement euh, à, à Cléo. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Lily. I'm a 2008 scholar. Um, so I would like to pick up where you left, not at the cute puppy, but before that. So I'm, my question is around the fault lines, the contingencies and the disasters and emergencies and Plan Z. So what, what is your recommendation? Like you mentioned Russia with its great plans about food security. Well, it doesn't work. You know, like everything the country does takes power away from the small independent producers, so on and so forth. So they will be hungry. Russians will be hungry and thirsty, along with many other countries, right? So what is your recommendation in terms of contingency planning? Like, what is the plan B for our planet as we reach our boundaries and we get hungry and thirsty? I know it's a small question to ask, but what are your thoughts? Hi, thanks. Uh, I think that, okay, is this okay? Yeah. Um, it, the, the point of the presentation is that there are a lot of different systems in play at the moment. So uh, in, there isn't one problem. There's a billion different problems, and it's going to take a billion different sorts of solutions. So a lot depends on, uh, on, on where you are and what the immediate problem is. Um, the, the point is that the, the Western economic system is perceived to have failed. So 2008 cost China officially about $1.3 trillion. It cost the Middle East more than that. 
And those, those are basically currently kind of the only countries really, maybe a little bit of Japan and potentially India after the next election, we'll see, that have any money. So alternate systems are being set up. We're in a, a period of flux. And the West is being marginalized. So the answer to the question depends on where you're looking at. I was just, I just came from India two days ago. I was at a conference, actually I wasn't allowed into the conference, but the university where I'm at uh, was holding a conference called Asia Uninterrupted. Now, the, the question of course is who was interrupting Asia? And the understanding was very much the West had interrupted the natural cohesion of Asia, that, that was the, the argument, by cutting it into blocks, and the time had come to reestablish an Asian common market back to kind of three, four hundred years ago where you would have had the Silk Route and various other maritime routes that went from Japan all the way to the Middle East. And I wasn't allowed into the conference because bluntly, they didn't want any white people there. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But that, that means that there are whole conversations that are happening outside of the ones that were happening in this, that are happening in this room. And it was a very serious conference. I mean, on the, I was talking to some of the people on the margins. There's former defense minister of Taiwan was there. Some very serious people from Iran were there. Some people, you know, one of the presidential advisors to Syria was there. So it really, the answer to that question is, it really depends on where you are. But because the whole economic system is in flux, the, um, the, the answer is gonna be economic Right? Kind of how do you make it so that it makes sense to get food into people's mouths? Um, and if you're China, you know, you need to feed your people, even if it's not economic, because you have a brittle authoritarian dictatorship and you don't feed them, they're going to be on the street and you're going to crash and burn. So the answer to their question is going to be very different than the answer to London's food security problem. Hi, Megan Daniels, a 2012 scholar. Thanks so much for your presentation and for distilling so much complex information in, into something that's very, um, that can reach a lot of us. Um, one thing that struck me uh, early on in your, uh, your presentation was talking about organizations like the BRICS Bank that's kind of coming to replace these overarching global institutions like the IMF that frankly, I've always taken as a given. That's what people or countries start to buy into. And so, and then you said at the end, of course, that one of the problems that you see before the cute puppy picture was that um, some of these new types of institutions are copying the worst of the former Western regimes. But do you, on the other hand, do you see any kind of hope for these new types of institutions that are emerging um, as these, uh, you know, as, with these shifts in geophysical, geopolitical, and geoeconomic uh, maps of the world? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, I mean, it's a really good question. A lot depends on what systems end up coming to the fore. I spent a lot of time in India because, uh, for me, India is w one of the hopes going forward. It is multicultural. It is largely market-based. It's democratic, sort of more or less secular. Um, and I would much prefer to see uh, an Indian influence in global uh, or creation of new structures than China's influence. So if you talk about, and we had this talk about, you know, this morning, very interesting talk about responsible citizenship. If you're Tibetan, your only way of being a responsible citizen for, for many people is to set, set yourself on fire, right? Like that's not a global system that you want to promote. And, and the way China, China benefits from engaging with dictatorships because that means that the deals they sign are gonna last a long time. They have a long-term plan, they want their partners to be there long-term. So that's why you see China in Zimbabwe, propping up Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And they're setting up a, an intelligence training uh, facility in Zimbabwe for its Southern African intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. right? So we're in flux, as, as mentioned before, and I'm hoping that the systems that come to the fore uh, that aren't Western systems are going to be more along the Indian model than along the Chinese model. The problem with that is, or the challenge for India, for example, is that they're, as they're closer to the Western systems, they're getting hobbled by their Western allies. So the um, sort of the, the U.S.-India nuclear deal, for example, was uh, trying to uh, put things like caps on liabilities for, for new nuclear power installations. I mean, you can discuss whether they should have them or not. 
but it's an example of how being close to the West can actually be detrimental right now to developing a, a strong economic system. If they had signed on to those US deals, it would have been potentially very dangerous for, for the local population, which would have created political upheaval and all sorts of those sorts of problems. So uh, we are at a very interesting time. All these th mm. three systems are in flux. And there is hope, but we need to realize that by weakening our allies, we're weakening ourselves. So the time, we, during the Cold War, we established relationships of allegiances. They ha now they have to be relationships of real alliances, where you mm. give your partners more freedom of movement. You don't try to force trans-Pacific partnership deals down their throats that are gonna wreck their medical system. You have to give them some room to breathe. And then as they grow, if you have a good relationship, they'll help, they'll bring us along with them. Hello, Felix Van Gaia. I see you again, Cleo. Nice to see you. Right, this is um, difficult to actually come up with one sort of sharp question in such a broad ranging issue. Uh, but um, here it is. I was talking to Joe Oliver 16 months ago, and I said to him, I think it's probably more a case of when rather than if the United States has a conflagration with China over some aspect of South China Seas, whether it's like the Kurals, the Spratlys, Taiwan, whatever. And you can bet your bottom dollar that one of the strategies is to close the Malacca Strait so that China doesn't get its oil from the Middle East. So how's that going to leave Canada if you're supplying LNG and oil sands crude over the Pacific to China? Are you going to would your longest standing trade partner, biggest trade partner and ally, listen to Washington and do an energy embargo on China. And his reply was, we will honor our commercial and contractual commitments. So I was just wondering um, what your thoughts might be on this. Yeah, it's a good question. It, it, it has a, a lot of different assumptions in it. Um, I think that the, that the US's allies in the region would hope that uh, the US would get involved. I'm not so sure that they would get involved. And that's why you see countries like uh, Japan uh, shifting major investment into India because they feel that India is more likely to back them up in a conflict with China than the US is. So uh, an Indian strategist actually recently went on Chinese TV and said, please keep saying bad things about Japan because every time you do, India gets another billion dollars worth of investment. So the money is, Japanese money is moving out of China and into India because there's questions about the US being able to fulfill its security uh, promises in the region. And, and that was made very clear recently during the government shutdown when Obama didn't go to Asia because the government had shut down. And so you had, you had people in Vietnam and the Philippines saying, what happens if during the next shutdown, you know, China attacks us? Like, who do we call? Who's gonna pick up the phone? So I have a, I, I, I'm, I think there's some real questions about whether the US would get involved to that degree. Also, China has said they would do, whether they would or not, has said they would do a first strike nuclear attack on the US. They're very aggressive in their posturing against the US. But they also tend to try to undermine um, uh, other countries through proxies. So I think they would just be as likely to use North Korea to create a kind of diversionary tactic for dealing with the US in that kind of situation and bog them down there. So I'm not so sure that the Malacca Strait would get cut off. There are too many uh, other factor, economic factors involved. The other, the other thing is, of course, Canada would do whatever Canada would do, but China is creating contingency for that, obviously, with the developing relationship with Russia and the Arctic and creating another route of oil supply through Russia. So it's a very dynamic situation at the moment. Art Hansen, um, past uh, mentor in the uh, uh, Trudeau Foundation. I spend most of my time working with China on environment and development. And I, I, I pretty much agree with uh, most, at least most of the things that you say about China. And, and uh, even as you point out that China is making these arrangements with countries like Tonga and the Iceland, took me quite a while to figure out why on earth there was so much going on with Iceland, but it's, it's true. A lot of these smaller countries, Sri Lanka would be another one. Exactly. Um, and so the question in my mind, and uh, I, I, I have an answer to it myself, but I'm going to ask you the question, and that is, in the process, what about the big countries like Australia, and, and let's just say particularly Canada, uh, is China marginalizing the impact of our own country 
by its actions uh, and it's by its very strategic approach that it's taking, my sense is that it is that we are becoming less and less relevant in the picture, even though there may be things that we want and even though we have a substantial population of uh, uh, Chinese Canadians who uh, have their links to China. Uh, but I'm interested in your view on that. Do you think we are marginalized already and heading uh, down a road that's even greater in that direction with, uh, by the actions of China and by China's direct uh, uh, way in which it uh, perceives us? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's not just China's actions. I think it's our own actions. Yeah. So if you're, if you're in India, for, if you're in the Indian strategic or, or uh, political community, you talk about Canada, what they remember is... Uh, how Canada came out against the nuclear tests in 98. And the language was perceived to have been very racist. Hmm. You know, it's only white countries that can be trusted with the nuclear bombs. Or, rightly or, or not, understanding their perspective is, is very important. So Canada, if you're, in a, if you're in China or you're in India or Indonesia, Canada is a very lovely storehouse of nice natural resources. But the uh, leadership is not considered particularly sophisticated as... I mean, that not showing up for the Commonwealth was, is perceived to be a racist move in a lot of the world. Because, you know, there are a lot of countries that have human rights problems, right? But this was the one that was chosen, and it was chosen for narrow political domestic reasons. But the repercussions are much broader. So it's um, our actions are not keeping pace with an understanding of how we are perceived. And at the same time, China's running circles around us. They're, it has a very smart foreign policy team. Australia, just going to very quickly mention Australia, because we're not in the position of Australia yet. There is a very, Australia is part of the Five Eyes Security Alliance. It's, consi it's, it's not only supposed to be delivering the Pacific, but as we just saw, it's spying on Indonesia. It's supposed to be considered a reliable ally from an intelligence perspective throughout the region. But there's a very loud discussion going on within the Australian policy and security community about what is the future of Australia. Is it an Asian country or is it a European outpost? Mm. Now, if you look at it economically, 25% of the exports go to China. And you have people like Prime Minister Keating saying that the US should share the Pacific with China. Now, that doesn't reassure allies like the Philippines or Vietnam who probably would be on the China side of the sharing, that Australia is a firm member of a Western security alliance. So there's even questions about the degree of Chinese influence within Australian policy making that is undermining its position. Now, Canada is not there yet. There's a lot of discussion about what's happening with the investment in the oil sands, for example, in the context of China. But we, we have the potential of just being seen as a satellite resource economy of China if we go down the route of Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Merci infiniment, Cléo. Alors, euh